Hey, this is Jonathan. Hey, thanks for joining me tonight. I see we have a lot of people on the call, so I'm going to jump right into this, and I'm going to answer as many questions as I can. You might notice below the video here that you're watching, below the, the stream, that there's a box where you can enter questions and send those to me so I could answer those live. I'm not going to end up doing that. I've got way too many, so if you want to put in a question, I'll try to get to it another time, or if possible, I'll respond to you by email, but I'm just going to go through the questions I've already got. I'm answering questions that came in when uh, individuals registered for this call, as well as I picked out a few questions that I hadn't got to here recently uh, that I normally respond to questions by email, and I just hadn't got to them yet. Next call is next month, December, first Tuesday of next month. So if you like this, then uh, register for that call. And if you wouldn't mind, if you like this, shoot me an email and tell me. Jonathan at LawnCareMillionaire.com. Tell me if it's good, and by all means, tell me if you'd like me to go a different direction or if there's something I can do to do this different. Obviously, I'm not making any money doing this, so I'd rather do what is of benefit than waste my time you know, doing something that that's not quite what you're looking for. So any feedback I could get would be awesome. How can I do this? How can I do a better job at this? All right, so... Let's go through the questions, and I'm going to try my best to not get too long-winded with my answers. We'll see if that really happens, but I'm going to try to get through these pretty quick. And the reason I'm doing this by video versus just a call, where you just call into a conference line that I've set up, is because there's some things that I might need to show you as we go through this. So half the time, you're probably just going to be looking at this screen right here, listening to me. But uh, I'll try to show you examples where it makes sense, but most of the time, I'm just going to be talking. All right, first question. I'm going to read them. Some of them, I'll paraphrase them. Basically, the first question is, what's your favorite online technology tools that you use to run your business? And so I'm going to talk about the tools that I use, that I like. I recommend every one of these I'm about to mention. So I'm going to zip through these. Um, hands down, the first one I use is Service Autopilot. So now LawnServiceSoftware.com is one of the sites. You can go there. That's hands down the, the most important tool I use because it runs everything in the business for everything I'm involved in. So that's a really big deal. You can check that out. I won't go into any details on that. The other one that's a really big deal is Gmail. So this is Gmail here. Um, this is just an empty account. Uh, I've got a Gmail address called sellmorework at gmail.com. It's empty. I don't get any email here. But this will let me show you a couple things. So basically, probably three years ago, I got away from Outlook at a different company that I was owner in for years. We had a lot of employees and we had servers set up with yeah, Microsoft Exchange running and it was managing all of our Outlook email and our Blackberries and all that stuff. And it was all nice, but it costed a lot of money to run it. It costed a, we had an IT guy that we would call every time we needed some help to come deal with all that stuff, to manage our servers, to manage our email, Exchange, all that stuff. Well, pretty much the tools I'm going to show you here have eliminated that. So none of the stuff I'm in, none of the businesses I'm involved with now use IT guys or have servers. It's completely unnecessary. So we've saved a lot of money. Exchange Server costs thousands of dollars to run, and every time there's a problem, you've got to get an IT guy involved. So with Service Autopilot, no IT guy needed. can access it from anywhere on any device. With Gmail, again, no server guy, no server, no IT guy. Access it from anywhere. I want the entire, everything I would do, I want it to be completely mobile so that I can be anywhere and run my business with a cell phone. I want to be able to be in Colorado for a month of the year if I want to and work just like I'm at the office with everybody else. I want our guys to be able to work from their homes when they can't make it in or work from in their truck if they're out in the field. So that's the concept. So I think email needs to abide by that same rule. So we use Gmail. So now when I say Gmail, I don't just mean, you know, ch set up an, a company email address that is your company at gmail.com. What you can do here is you set that up, but you also go in here and you can click on settings. So go to account settings. And then you look over here for Gmail settings, and it'll get you into the settings screen. If it doesn't look exactly this way for you, then just look around. Then go over here to this accounts and import. And once you're on this screen, if you scroll down here, this is the screen where you're going to set all this up. So this check mail using POP3, just click add a POP3 mail address. So you can use the free version of this or you can use the uh, work version, which is $50 per employee per year. So if you had a personal address, like let's say I had a personal address, which is you know, Jonathan at mycompany.com, 
I would just put that in. I'd hit next step and it would walk me through the process of setting this up. So if in Microsoft Outlook or one of your email clients or email programs, you have ever set up your username and password, your web address, your, the whole POP3 settings, then um, you do it exactly the same way in Gmail. So my point of, and I'm not going to walk through this, but my point is you can have Gmail check all of your accounts. So for example, my Gmail account checks my all my business email addresses, my personal email address, and my Gmail email address. So I think I have five or six email addresses all checked by one account, and Google segments all the email by account for you. You can do all kinds of cool stuff like labels. If you've ever used um, labels is one of my favorite features in here. So if you go back to the settings section, if you just look around for the option called labels, then labels are like tags. If you've ever used tagging, it's like tags. So play around with Gmail. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's the way to go. And then for each of our businesses, in addition to each employee having their Gmail account, we have a company Gmail account. So like, for example, at Service Autopilot, it's support at serviceautopilot.com. Well, that's actually checked by Gmail. And so we have somebody that is in charge of the email and watches the account. And, and uh, you know, and so all the email funnels into one place, but I can check the support account. Sometimes you know, it's not uncommon for me once uh, every couple of days to log into the support account and just check and see what's out there, what's going on but somebody else manages all that or a couple people can manage it. And then if I need to respond to a specific email, they just tag it. They use that labeling I was talking about. They just tag it with my name and I go through there every couple days and respond to emails. So great way to run the business. All right, so those are my top two. Now my third one is inside Gmail, you can go to more and you could set up a reader right here. So this reader here, let me see if I can do something like this really quick. I can go in here and I could click... Um, Let's see here. Subscribe. And I could put in www.lawncaremillionaire.com. If I could type, hit add. Now it's on my reading list. So what's going to happen now is there's Lawn Care Millionaire. Every time I post something new, if you were using Google Reader, you'd be able to see it. It would show. And so I have an iPhone or on an iPad, I can just go log into my Gmail account where I'm checking my email and I can click on Reader up at the top and it shows me everybody's blog that I read, all the articles that I follow, all the everything I follow, it shows me all the new updates. So for example, if you follow Long Care Millionaire, then as you read something in the Reader, it marks it as read. So next time you're in your Gmail account, you can click Reader and it, over here on the right, it'll show you everything you, you're following and everything you haven't read. It'll track what you haven't read yet. So you that way I don't have to go to 20 different websites to track and read stuff. It aggregates it all into my reader for me and I just read it. And then if I don't read it, it keeps it as unread. Or if I never want to read it, I just click on it and it marks it as read. And it's like email. It works very much like email. It'll keep up with what you've read, what you haven't read, and you can just read it when you have time. But you don't have to go to five, ten different sources. It all funnels into one place. So Google Reader, I'm a big fan of that. Um, two more. I really, really like and I don't use it enough. I like um, Evernote. This is a great product. This is a really, really, really good product. And um, I, it works on mobile devices. These guys have done a nice job of building dedicated apps for each device. And so it works on iPhones, iPads, Android, HTC. It works on all these devices quite nicely. Great, great product. You should check it out. They got a free version. And I mean, I if I'm traveling somewhere and I see something I like, I can just snap a picture of it and it will um, it'll keep it. Re you can read about it. I'm not going to give you all the details. This is something you should check out. Really good site. Also a big fan of Dropbox. So Dropbox, D-R-O-P-B-O-X.com. Again, you can start out with a free service that will think it will give you two gigs of free storage. This is a great way to archive stuff in your company and store it off. And it's a great way to um, share files between each other. Just a great service. It, it basically, you drop a file. If, you, if you're on a laptop or an iPad and you drop a file in Dropbox, it'll sync it up on all your devices. So everything I do, I want it to be remote. I'm trying to get away from all my desktop-based software. This is the future. Everything from everywhere. I mean, everything accessible from everywhere. This being confined to desktop stuff is the end. It's come. It's not going to last forever. It's going to last for a lot longer, but it's not the most optimal way to run the business. So features like Dropbox here are just really, really cool. And this company's solid. Both Evernote and Dropbox are 
are they have tons of investment. This is something I think about a lot, you know, and it and something you definitely want to think about as well. You know, one of the concerns is if you go start using a product or a service that may not stick around, that isn't a profitable company yet, that may go out of business, um, you know, you've wasted all your time dropping your files out there and setting it all up. So I think about that. I trust that Dropbox and Evernote are not going anywhere. Number one, I think both are actually profitable. And number two, they've got ridiculous amount of investment money. A lot of times investment money doesn't mean anything because these companies can go under when the, they stop getting funded. However, these guys are already profitable. So I think you're pretty safe using both these services. I'm going to throw in a bonus one. I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't even going to mention this. I like Mosey. I'm sure there's other ones out there that are really good, but Mosey.com. I use this. I have it set up on my uh, computers. I have it set up all over. The, I have it set up on a lot of stuff, and it just automatically backs up my system for me every night. I don't even have to mess with it. So I know there's alternatives, but I've been using Mosey for years now. They're very solid. I think they're owned by EMC, which is a huge data storage company. So again, I trust it. I trust the security of it. I trust they're not going away. And um, Mosey is a great service. I think I pay $4.95 a month to back up. So well worth it. $4.95 a month. Auto charge my credit card. It's in my mind a no brainer. So really good. Um, I think that's it. Let's move on to the next question. The next question is, should I get my LLC first or can I get the services and then get the LLC? So basically this, this is a good question here. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but can you basically go out and start selling work and Make some money and then file your business as an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. Absolutely. In fact, I think you should do that. Here's um, where should you? It has slipped my mind where you should go. I'll tell you who I like. Um, I like LegalZoom right here. Biz Filings is good. I filed several LLCs through Biz Filings. This LegalZoom.com here is good. So my suggestion would be that. You might want to um, prove that you like the lawn care business, prove that you're going to can sell work, prove that you can make money, prove that you're going to stick with it, and then go spend the money to get your LLC. Don't wait too long because there's a lot of benefits to the LLC. And a um, couple quick side notes on this one. If you set up your personal bank accounts, even a business bank account that's not under your LLC, when you file the LLC, you need to either close – you probably need to close the account and reopen it under the name of the LLC – or you need to change the name on the account. You'll just have to deal with your bank on that one. Do that. That's a big deal. But you need to have everything in the LLC's name. Um, another item to consider with the LLC, I'm not going to give you any legal advice or accounting advice on this stuff. If you're going big with your business, if you're going to turn it into something and um, you want to consider looking at an LLC doing business as an S-Corp. File as an LLC and then you file a form to essentially do business as an S-Corp or in a sense be recognized as an S-Corp. I'm not going to go into any details on that. Just check it out. Get advice to see if that's an idea for you. A lot of guys just run as a straight LLC. Nothing wrong with that. But uh, you might want to um, you might want to do a little additional research on that one if you're going to go and build a business that's going to be doing in the millions. So um, LegalZoom, great service. I do trademarks there. I do all kinds of stuff. All right, next question. All right, so this one here is, let's see here, this one is, can you suggest some direct marketing response literature? Yes, I can. Actually, this is a multi-part question, so let me, uh, let me see here. Amazon, direct response. Um, anything by this guy, Dan Kennedy. I really like him. Dan Kennedy right here. If you go check him out, he's got a bunch of books. Um, read it. You read, should read everything this, that he's put out. Um, Dan Kennedy's great. Uh, specifically, let me see if I can find the books. The um, this one is a great book. I mean, they're all good. I'm not, but this is a good book. This would be. I would put this at the top of your reading list. The Ultimate Marketing Plan. I would put. Here's a good book on direct marketing. Direct marketing, put that one on your list. And he's got one that's just like a general business. It's like, I um, can't remember the name of it. I don't remember the name of it, but search around. Buy all his books. Just buy them all and read them. They're all good. Um, also, this is one of my favorite books ever written. 
The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. It's not so much about direct response marketing. Great book right there, The Ultimate Sales Machine. Um, check out, no harm checking out this guy, Perry Marshall. Perry Marshall learned a tremendous amount from Dan Kennedy. That's where he got, I believe he got his start. I may be misquoting that, but Perry Marshall's got a great book here called The Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords. Perry Marshall is a good guy. Um, I am often disappointed by a lot of the marketing guys. They don't all practice what they preach, and I don't like the way they sell some of their stuff, and sometimes it's all about the money, less about the product. I'm big on marketing. Don't get me wrong there, but sometimes I'm disappointed by some of the guys out in the marketplace and, and essentially their ethics and what they'll do to make a buck and what they'll say to make a buck. And um, usually a lot of the marketing guys are really, really good at marketing, really, really poor at business. That's a very broad statement because that's not completely true. There's a lot of really good guys like everybody I just recommended. My point is Perry Marshall's the real deal. He's a good guy. So anything uh, that Perry Marshall says, I think you can listen to it. I uh, just uh, I think highly of him. He's quite ethical. Um, from there, there's a million books you can read. You know, uh, check out... Jay Abraham, get everything you you uh, get everything you can out of everything you got. Uh, the sticking point solution right here. Both of these books are solid books. Uh, direct response marketing. Go back and read. There is a domain. It is um, the Gary Halbert letter. It's free. The Gary Halbert letter. So the Gary Halbert letter dot com. So this headline with a dot com at the end. Go to this site. Scroll down and click click here to view our newsletter archive. Gary's dead. Um, been been uh, he passed away a couple years ago. Arguably one of the best guys that's ever been in the business of direct response marketing. Just read down here and read some of his. Um, you know I haven't looked at this later lately. It's got a password on it. It used to be free. Just scroll around see if it's free. You may just need to register. It may still be free, but you'll have to check this out. I um, Great stuff there. Anything you read by Gary Halbert's worth your time. So that's enough to get you started. So those are some good things. There's plenty, but those are some really good books that I would read. All right. Any ch next question, same fella uh, from Tim here. Any chance, you, any chance of purchasing a packet from you of sample ads you've used in the past? Not yet. Um, yeah, I'm going to be doing something like that. It's going to be called the Roadmap Series, and I'm planning to start it in January. Um, it's probably going to be $97 a month. I'm just, I say probably because I'm still working out the final details, but here's basically how it's going to work. Um, I'm not just going to give this stuff out, but if you want to join, I am going to once a month. I'm going to tell you exactly what you should do in your business that month. I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. I'm going to give you the step-by-steps, and I'm going to give you all the examples. And as much as I can, it's going to be done for you. So, for example, one of the first ones I'm going to do is this really important lead letter that you've got to be sending out. I've tested. It's all going to be stuff I've tested that works. So if you want to shortcut this and save hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can just subscribe to my roadmap series. I'm going to go through 12 things a year, one a month. All you got to do is implement one thing a month. You'll have, I mean, if you just implement this one thing a month, it'll be like buying into a franchise for fit thirty thousand bucks and giving them nine percent of your gross margins every month. I'm just going to lay out to you like what a franchise would lay out to you, but I think better. And it's not just going to, it's a whole ninety-seven bucks a month. So great example. One of the first ones I'm going to do is a lead letter. I'm going to tell you how it works. I'm going to tell you exactly how to send it. I'm going to tell you exactly what it's going to say. I'm going to tell you everything about the entire process, why you're going to do it, what I figured out from testing it. Then I'm just going to give you the letter. And you just make a couple tweaks to it and you put it into practice. And so that's the concept is I'm going to tell you why you should do it, tell you how to do it, and then I'm going to give you the stuff to just do it. So I will be doing marketing pieces and I'm just going to give you the marketing pieces and I'm even going to hook you up with somebody that you can call up on the phone or email and they'll tweak it to put your logo on it, things like that. It's all done for you. So um, that service, uh, that whole offering called the Roadmap Series, it's, I believe it's, we're going to have that ready to go and it's going to launch in January of 2012. So check back here at Long Care Millionaire for that one if that's interesting to you. That's going to be a big deal. Uh, the third question is you've mentioned, pur you've mentioned purchasing mailing lists of potential customers. Would something like this even exist in our small market of, and he gives his city, um, 
Yes. Yes, it would exist everywhere. If so, where would we look? Okay, good one here. Um, really popular one is this infousa.com, so infousa.com. This is a really popular place to go buy mailing lists. This is good. Um, this one here is better, Zap Data, owned by Dun and Bradstreet. Uh, Dun and Bradstreet spends ridiculous money to uh, verify data, so Zap Data is a good one. But uh, InfoUSA is good too. I'd probably start here with Zap Data. Now, if you start getting really advanced on buying lists, like for example, let's say you get to the point where you've reverse profiled your client base, and you know that your typical client is between 30. Well, let's just use it. Let's get even more specific. Your ideal client is between 35 and 55. He lives in a house over 300 grand. Uh, you can go buy that list pretty easily. But then, if you figure out that your typical client, your best client, also tends to be a professional, like an entrepreneur, a dentist, a doctor, um, a sales executive, something of that sort, then you can refine it down even further and buy a list of guys between 35 and 55, live in houses over 300 grand, and are that type of professional. And if you want to, you figure out that your ideal clients are actually tend to be married, that 80% of the time your best clients are married, and you can refine that list even further, and you can buy a list of all that criteria, plus they've got to be married. The point is, you could start out with a list of people that's 50,000 homes, 50,000 people, and by the time you're all done and you spend, and it costs you some money to get this list, but you could get it down to maybe your 4,000 highest probability clients. Well, then you focus all your money on just getting those 4,000 clients. You just mail them and mail them and mail them and mail them. Now, if you're going to do that, you can do some of that through the Zap data. Sometimes it's better to actually go find a list broker for that, a guy that knows where to source the lists from, a guy that possibly could go to a, bro a broker that could go buy two lists and then merge the two together for you. So that gets a little more complex. But if you're keeping it pretty simple, Zap data is great. All right, next question. All right, this one has to do with equipment. Should I buy Toro Personal Pace 22-inch mower for 350 or Xmark 21-inch for 1200? Keep in mind, I can buy more if I opt for with Toro. Yeah. Okay. So I think I know that I, I'm suspecting that the Personal Pace 22-inch is like the homeowner edition of mowers, and that you're probably picking up at Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that. So I'm speculating here. There is no way in the world that I would run my business with a bunch of personal pace mowers and be able to throw them out. So like, for example, like let's say I could go buy Xmark or Toro 21-inch mowers. They're commercial. They cost more money. Or I could have four times more mowers and just junk them as I'm done with them and use the personal pace mower. The home edition, they definitely go the commercial route. No doubt about it, hands down. Now, if the dilemma is not so much which piece should you really use for the money, if it's about, hey, right now money's tight, I'm kicking off the business, getting going, and all I can afford is 350 bucks, then absolutely go buy the $350 mower and use it for a couple, a month or so until you get enough money and then switch to the commercial because the commercial is not about just longevity. The commercial is about production. You're in the business of selling time. And so... This is why I'm so big, such a big believer on software or having the right cell phone. I mean, if let's just if you're gonna use an example outside of equipment, let's just use a cell phone example because we all have cell phones. You know, if you have this crappy cell phone that half the time it doesn't work and you got to reboot it and it drops calls and you can't email from it or you can't text message from it, you know, you got all these problems with it and so it's constantly slowing you down and costing you money. You know, cell phones are a couple hundred bucks. Why wouldn't you go buy the right cell phone? Because the $200 versus the amount of time you're losing or because you're spending so much time, you're doing less work and you're billing out less work, it's a no-brainer. Get a new cell phone. Same with software. I mean, I see these guys, I see guys all the time. They'll go spend 350 bucks or 1000 bucks on a piece of software that is just absolutely inadequate compared to what they could spend a little bit more money on and do so much more with. And, you know, you can't just look at the cost on something. You've got to look at the return on investment. You've got to look at the hidden cost. You've got to look at the opportunity cost. By doing X, how much more of Y will I get? That's opportunity cost. So if you buy a crummy software package or a crummy cell phone, how much money are you going to lose that you don't even see it, you don't even know about, but what's the opportunity cost of making one decision versus another decision? And what's all the hidden cost to it or the hidden revenue that you'll never realize because you made the wrong decision? That's how you've got to look at things. 
So the same is true on equipment here. You don't just – and I'm, I'm probably coming across a little negative here. My point is that I can tell you from personal peer, uh, personal experience that to answer your question, yes, the the commercial mower is worth three times more than the uh, personal – the mower that a residential homeowner would be – would use. Not just from a reliability standpoint but from a speed standpoint because that's why I said earlier you're selling time here. It's all about production. It's all about productivity. And it's all about, you know, if it breaks down, if it's slow, if you've got constant problems, if it doesn't cut the grass as fast, if with, when the grass, grass is wet, it doesn't cut as well. So all of these factors, this extra piece, this better equipment is going to lead to better quality, faster production speeds, more hourly earned revenue, happier employees, um, less breakdowns, less dissatisfaction because you don't make it to the client's property less scheduling problems. I mean, it's just, it's huge. And on top of that, from my personal experience, I can buy new equipment all year long, run it all year, take really good care of it, sell it all at the end of the year for a good amount of money. So there's a lot more resale value as well to a used piece of uh, commercial equipment. So I would say, yes, spend the money. But if it's a, if it's a cash crunch problem, then by all means, uh, buy the cheap mower and as fast as you can upgrade that thing. All right, next question. All right, so this question is from somebody getting back in the business. And it says, I had a, oh, this, is, this is not lawn care, but it's similar. I had a pest control business, got rid of it once the economy got really bad. I'm now in the process of going back into the military. And once I get in, I want to mow lawns on the side. My question is, when you bill your clients, how exactly do you do it? Do you have the tech pick up the check while, the, while he's mowing the lawn for residential, or do you just send out bills to the address? How do you bill both residential and commercial clients? Okay. You may have heard me answer this one before, but I get this so much, I'm going to answer it again. Okay. We do commercial and residential. We're more heavily weighted towards residential, and for commercial, we bill our commercial clients once a month. And I believe it's, well, it's all over the board during the month, but it's gener it's once a month. And most of our commercial clients pay with a check. Some pay with credit card, but that's not overly common. Most are paying with a check. Most of our commercial clients, we do bill them in advance. So for example, if uh, the invoice, if the contract starts in, well, let's just use an example. Let's say you got a month, you got a contract that we bill 850 a month on. And the next invoice is due on February, so it's going to cover the month of February 1 through February 28. We will mail that invoice generally on January 15th or maybe January 20th, so that it's arriving, getting into their payable system to be paid near the beginning of February. So we are not waiting till the end of February to submit our invoices for commercial. Now, not all commercial companies will go for this. The bigger the properties get, the bigger the client the more they're going to force your hand on the way things happen. Um, it's your choice if that's if you uh, want to work with clients like that. I mean, it's just it, so you, there, if you're in commercial and the client says, if you want to work with us, you're going to get paid every 60 days. You're going to get 60 day terms. We're going to pay you after the fact and there's going to be a float. Then that's how it's going to be. And if you want to work with them, you work with them and you just got to be able to cash flow the job. And well, we just we're just a little pickier about the way we do things especially as we've gotten bigger. So we, uh, we don't work with everybody in commercial. We cherry pick commercial. I want, I, I want margins. I want the same margins out of commercial. I can get out of residential. Or I'm not going to waste my time. I'd rather put my commercial crews on residential properties for better margins. So a part of margins to me is cash flow. How fast do I get paid? If I'm having to float, um, you know, if I have a $2 million a year that I have to float uh, because of poor cash flow or whatever the case may be, then there's a cost to that. And uh, it costs money to float money, and so I am picky about that. So that's just how we work. And there's nothing wrong with however you choose to do it. But to answer your question, um, we bill monthly on commercial, but we bill it in advance. And I can't think of any clients that we don't get that we don't have that arrangement with them. And that has meant we haven't got some work in the past, and that's okay. Um, as your business gets bigger and you figure out who your ideal client is and what kind of profit margins you want, then uh, there's a lot of work that's just 
no longer acceptable to you and you just let it go even if it's uh you know quite a bit of money so the that's commercial that's almost exclusively how commercial works for us now what really happens in the commercial industry is generally you're going to you're going to submit an invoice at the end of each month and you're going to get paid the next month with the 30 day terms perfectly okay and it's generally going to be with the check now residential um what we do there and it costs a tremendous amount of money in it's it's cost you know six figures a year in credit card fees but we are uh charging credit cards once a week so what we do is at the time I'm recording this, I don't know, it's 25, somewhere approaching 3,000 clients are auto-charged credit cards once a week uh, for the residential side of the business. And basically what we do is every Tuesday we charge credit cards. We don't do it the day of, we do it once a week. So we'll, if we're at your property and we work Monday through Friday, any work we perform this week will be billed next Tuesday to your credit card automatically and you'll immediately receive an email paid email invoice by email line iteming out everything we did for you during that time period if the invoice exceeds a certain amount of money then we will email you the invoice with a note it's all set up and it will email you an invoice with a note and we'll auto charge that credit card next week that is an exception that I haven't talked about a lot but we auto charge the credit cards every Tuesday for the previous week I'm not even going to explain why Tuesday's the day. I guarantee it. Not Thursday, not Friday, Tuesday. Not Monday, Tuesday. I guarantee it. So Tuesday's the day. Bill them for everything the week before. There's a whole lot of reasons, a whole lot of thought that went into that. We've tried different things. And always bill on Tuesday. That is absolutely critical. Um, meaning that you don't do it Tuesday this week and then next week Wednesday and then maybe Thursday. You've got to be very, you got to be, you have to have a regimen. You've got to do it every Tuesday. You got to, if you're going to, require that people pay with credit cards you have to be predictable they have to know what they're going to get you have to be reliable and you got to charge it on the same day every single week you can't be changing the way you do things or people start to lose faith in the whole system now if that bill was not pre-approved meaning a client because we do a we're different in this area too we do a lot of just go out and do the work client calls up says we needed the bushes trimmed or, and um we don't go do a quote. Sometimes we do, but we don't always go do quotes. So we go out there and we trim the bushes and it's 400 bucks and they didn't know how much the bill was going to be in advance. Then we send them an invoice and a note that they will be by email, that they will be charged or sometimes by mail, but generally by email, that they'll be charged for this amount next Tuesday. And so in that case, we don't actually charge the credit card that week, that the week after we notify them about the job and tell them the date in the future where we're going to charge it. That really cuts down on chargebacks. We don't have hardly any chargebacks each year. And, and also we find that as just a good high, high level of customer service. Let's just, you know, we're messing with somebody's money here. If they didn't know what the bill is going to be and they didn't agree to it up front, let's tell them about it. If they have any concerns, any questions, let's solve it before we ding their credit card. So that's the way we operate. Um, we grandfathered in when we came up with this idea several years ago and moved everybody over to auto credit card charging. Um, we grandfathered everybody in. So I don't remember how many clients I had at the time, but we offered the service to them. Most did not take it. Every month in their invoice, uh, we kept billing them where they could pay by check. And every month in the invoice, we'd have a yellow insert inside the invoice promoting the program. And some percentage switched over. I don't remember what it was. It wasn't a big percentage. And so even to this day, some of my clients from back then are still grandfathered in. And they still will pay with a check every month, and that's fine because as long as they pay with their check on time, then uh, it, it's no big deal. But if they start slipping behind, then we eventually say, you know what, if to continue service, we're going to have to get a credit card. Hopefully it doesn't come to that, but we've had to do that with some clients. We've had to just be firm and say, hey, this is the policy. We've got to get paid with the credit card. And we only did that with old clients that were just very unreliable about paying their bills. So one thing you said, do you have the tech pick up the check while he's mowing? Absolutely not. I do not recommend that scenario, even when you're getting started. Train your customers from day one. Train them that they will mail you the check or you're going to charge their credit card, one or the other, whichever system you set up or both. But do not pick up the checks. That's not a sustainable system as you grow into a bigger company. And it just leads to confusion, lost checks, all kinds of problems. It leads to blame. Oh, I paid it. The crew must have picked it up. Don't know what happened to it. It's not my fault. And you don't want to have to have a client go stop payment on a check that costs them money, so it's just not worth it. All right, next question. 
How does your equipment maintenance team work? How do you operate that side of the business so it's smooth and you stay ahead, or stay hands off? All right, so without giving you all the details, we have tried all kinds of things. When I first started the company, I had the crews do the maintenance, and then I took all the equipment. I had them do their, you know, their air filters. I had them change, sharpen their blades. I had them doing that kind of stuff. They were responsible for their own equipment. Tried all kinds of different things over the year. At this point, we've taken it all out of the crew's hands. And the reason behind that philosophy is it's kind of the same philosophy as we have bush trimming guys trim, pest control guys spray, furt and weed guys, that's what they do, mowing guys mow. And now sometimes that varies on commercial, but if, if we're out of com big commercial properties, then that means we got a bush trimmer, a guy that can do trimming on the truck. If they're, my point is, if they're going to trim and mow at the same time, then there's a guy that's trained to do that. But and he always does the bush trimming at each property. I really, really believe that you can make a guy an expert from a quality standpoint. You can be far better if you focus guys on being very, very good at what they do. So rather than trying to have a guy be really good at mowing, really good at putting down fertilizer, being good at treating ants when he's out the property being good at spraying roundups and flower beds if that's what they do or you know whatever it is instead of in trimming bushes and planting flowers why not divide it up and this gets easier as you get bigger and make your bush trimming guys experts at bush trimming you can invest the time then in those guys and teach them how to trim your bushes properly how do you shape them from round bushes from the bottom up how do you prune correctly which kinds of bushes um, during certain temperatures don't get pruned all the way back which which bushes were basically the are supposed to have more of a loose form to them that versus a more tightly manicured form how do you properly prune all those types of things so much easier to train you know three crews in our case I think four crews of uh, guys for bush trimming than it would be to train 25 crews I mean, if I had to train all the employees, it would be a disaster. We could never make them really, really good at bush trimming. So we focus. All right, I got a little off track, but the point of telling you that is focus, 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 focus. I've all I've been the number one violator of this, and I have I'm you know I used to have multiple companies. Now I'm I only own two, and it just leads to uh, being better at what I do. And inside my companies, I'm getting more and more focused and it leads to the companies being better at what they do and so the same is true of your team the more focused they are the better they're going to be the more scattered they are the more uh, complaints you're going to have the more quality problems you're going to have the more everything you're going to have and it just makes your life miserable so look for learning from that we've done the same thing with maintenance our maintenance guys do maintenance now I still don't have a full-time maintenance person but I've got a bunch of part-time guys and they come in at night they come in on the weekends uh, we come in and they'll sharpen 100 blades. We change blades every single day on every single mower. So they come in and they'll do 100 blades at once and they'll change all the oil. And then every day all the blades are rotated on the equipment, but they're not sharpened every day. They're sharpened you know, at 100 at a time or whatever the number is. It's a big number. And they are uh, in there, you know, these guys can come in and they can fuel up equipment. They can come in, they can fill up tanks and have them ready. They can mix fuel they can maintain blades they can tighten uh, they can tighten up cables they can change out wheels and tires that's their job and they're part-time guys that come in in off hours and they do all this and then for engine repair stuff that we can't do ourselves with our part-time guys that come in that are totally focused on maintenance then we we take we have somebody in our business or those guys as well actually can take it and drop it off and get it repaired which, not to get too sidetracked, but this is one of the big reasons why I'm very, very fond of getting a very good relationship with your vendors so that you get fast service. Push your buying dollars through one vendor if possible and really become, you know, like we are, I think I heard that we are now the biggest buyer from our vendor. I may be wrong on that, but we're definitely at the top. And so we buy more equipment, I think, than anybody else from this vendor we buy from. May be incorrect, but it's something like that. Well, Obviously, it wasn't always that way, but by focusing our dollars through one vendor, they don't want to lose our business. They want to take care of us. We develop a really good relationship with them. We know all the guys there, and so we get priority service. And you can achieve the same thing as a smaller business. I mean, when I first started, 
I had a small business and I was, you know, one spray tech and I got really good service by getting to know the guy at Lesco and he helped me out a ton and I was not a big fish. I mean, at all. I mean, I was tiny, barely buying anything from this guy, but simply by developing relationships and, you know, and, uh, being friendly and a good guy to work with. My point is that you can develop relationships with your vendor. So you don't have to do all your own equipment repair. And I don't suggest it when you're a smaller company. And even to this point, we don't do all of our own repair. We do what we can, everything else we take to our vendors. But by then developing those relationships, you can still get fast turnover. So now for going a little further into the maintenance, basically we have uh, sections. Uh, basically we have warehouses. We have a place set up specifically for maintenance. So our stuff is designed out so that there are stations to sharpen blades and change oil and all of this. There's pumps and grinders. I think, you know, our grinder, I think something like $1,400 and it grinds blades in I think 30 seconds or something like that. You know, we've, we've got all this stuff set up. We've got something set up where the grinder, as it's throwing off the flakes, it's catching them into this big box. Um, we've got all kinds of things set up in that shed. We just have in those in those areas that we work in, we've thought about this quite a bit. And we've thought about how does it need to be laid out so the guys can do this stuff quickly. We've got lots of extra parts. We pre-buy lots of wheels and cables and blades and filters and all this stuff. And we have it stocked up so that it's you don't have to constantly run to the parts supplier and order stuff. And so that's, you know, you could kind of figure out how you might want to set it up. But we have guys that come in, we have all everything they need set up in one place. They come in, they maintain it, they log what they do, and they leave. Um, in service autopilot in 2012, we'll have full equipment tracking and maintenance tracking, and it'll be it'll be way more advanced than anything else out there on the market that I've seen because it'll actually be trackable from a mobile. So right now it's all tracked on paper. It's not ideal, but it works and it's a good system. But eventually the guys will just be out there and. As they change the oil or as they do something, they'll just click on the piece of equipment, click on what they did, and it'll track it all. And so that's that's coming in time. But for now, the system still works nicely just by doing it with clipboards and paper and, and having good people. I mean, at the end of the day, everything comes down to good people. So if you can find some good part-time people to come in and do this stuff, one thing you might consider is looking at some of these uh, younger high school, early college kids that are into small engine repair. Um, in some cities, they have this stuff now, especially in the bigger cities at the high schools. It's not who we're using, but I know about it. Um, you know, there's kids learning this stuff in school now. There's plenty of guys that can find this. There's guys that are retired. Retired guys are awesome. Guys that just want something to do 15 hours a week or 20 hours a week, and they want to come dabble. Yeah, they may be a little slower than the younger guys, but they know what they're doing. They usually know how to do it, and um, they just want something to do. So there's lots of possibilities if you're creative about this. Let's move on to another question. Let's see here. Okay, I know I have a couple others here that are related to what I've already been talking about, so I'm going to find those here first. And then after that, I'm going to talk about some estimating, pricing. I think I've got some systems questions here, so I'm going to go through those. Okay, so I'm. let's do this one here. This one uh, is similar to what I just answered. How do you handle maintenance? I noticed this isn't included in Service Autopilot yet. I'm sure you use some software. How do you handle situations where something breaks down in the field and you have a crew waiting for a replacement? So I pretty much answered this question already. Let me just answer the last part of that. How do you handle situations where something breaks down in the field? Uh, basically what we're doing is on our trucks, we have a backup piece of equipment for everything. So every there's doubles of everything. So if you take a small residential crew, they're going to have at least an extra mower on the truck. And if you take they're going to have an extra weed eater. They don't have an extra line trimmer. I'm sorry, they don't have an extra stick edger, but they have an extra weed eater because worst case you can edge with the weed eater. We've got plenty of blowers. Now if something really significant happens, they call into the office and one of our guys is out there with them and taking them a piece of equipment. So it's really as simple as that. Now that creates downtime and you've got three or four guys, depending on the crew, sitting in a truck. Or really, if they, there's no way they're sitting in the truck. They, Two guys are still working. One guy's just, you know, not. But if they're sitting there, then there's a serious problem. So unless the truck breaks down. So and some of these problems just resolve themselves as you, you know, you get bigger. Like, for example, um, 
you know, now that we're bigger, we've got guys that can load up a mower from the shop and run it over to the crew or a weed eater or whatever the case may be. It used to be me that did that in the beginning, but uh, now we got somebody that can do it for us and we don't even have to touch it. So that's one. And then um, we've, you know, we're bigger. So if a truck breaks down, I've got a racing trailer for some stuff I do. And so it's got a winch and stuff. The guys can hook it up to the back of their own trucks, go pull the truck up on it, haul it away. Well, that's just kind of how where we're at now. But, um, you know, if we didn't have that, then in the times past, if a truck broke down, we'd two guys would run a truck over there. Or back in the, you know, when it was me, I'd run a truck over there and tow truck would come get the other truck. So, you know, stuff happens. And uh, you just kind of deal with it as it does. But as you get bigger, some of these problems work themselves out. And you've got some extra equipment. And, you know, we keep extra trucks. We have enough crews now that we're trying to keep one to two extra trucks on hand. Right now we don't have any extra trucks, but we're about to go into a buying mode. So, uh, you know, that's that's how you handle it. You just really as simple as that. Just try, try to have some backups. And if it's only you, you're going to take them the equipment. If not, somebody else is going to do it. Um, another question here is, this is another one related to equipment, so let's go ahead and do this. It says, can you show a video pics of your commercial box trucks and explain how you secure equipment in both your pickups for residential and your commercial trucks? I saw a video of custom pickup beds, but can't understand how your mowers get locked down. Would the system work with walk behinds, which I use in pickups or CTRs? Okay, now, I don't have any videos of our internals of some of our trucks. And a couple of them, we kind of don't want to show them. There is stuff I don't show on Lawn Care Millionaire or even talk about. And it's, as you can imagine, for, for good reason. But um, I can explain this one. And this one I'd be willing to show. I just don't have a video of it. But let me uh, let me kind of explain. Let's start out with the easy one. So if you've seen the pictures, and there's a video on Lawn Care Millionaire that I shot probably a year ago, just in the wintertime, walking by a few of the trucks that were still at the yard. And... Um, You'll notice they were just small rangers with custom beds. They're all extended cab rangers, so we can get three guys in the truck, and they have ex they have custom beds that we build and we stick on the trucks. And um, hey, and by the way, there's uh, whoever it was that just asked a question. I just saw it. I'm not going to get to it tonight. That said, they went and priced this custom bed like we're using on our rangers, and it was seven thousand bucks. That's about three times too much money. So keep shopping. Um, there's no way we're spending more than twenty five hundred bucks. I know in the very beginning it was around eighteen hundred dollars. Um, it's gone up as steel's gone up in price, and now we're on our uh, custom beds. Kind of is similar to the question being asked here, but on our custom big box truck beds, we're using aluminum bases. It's lighter. It's more expensive, but it's lighter. Chews up tires slower, burns less fuel. So there's reasons to think about instead of steel using aluminum floors. But that's just something to play with. It's not something to worry about and spend much time on. It's more important to grow the company. But when you get into the tweaking and optimizing stage of the business, that is stuff to think about. And so um, that will run your cost up a bit on your custom beds. So I, I don't know what we're buying these things at exactly, but it's in the low $2,000 range. I'd have to look at this point. So um, 7000 is way too much. Now, if you're buying a big bed to go on the back of a Isuzu, NPR or something of the sort, and it's gonna you're gonna drive riders up into that. Now it's a whole different deal. That is gonna cost you more money. You know, to build out a total box with tanks and all kinds of stuff, not tanks, but build out a box for our company that's designed perfectly for spraying and, and it's there's a there's a good bit to this box that goes on the truck. I mean we're getting close to ten thousand bucks to do something like that. So there is a range, but if if where I'm going with this is if you Talking about building out a small truck that you're primarily putting light equipment on it, 7000 is way too expensive. Even if you're doing an F-150, that's uh, that seems that's pretty high. So now let me answer the question. So the way this stuff gets locked down, let's go back to what I started to talk about. Imagine, if you would here, a residential truck. And let's see here real fast if I can find this video. All right, so I'm going to go... Let's go find this real quick. Give me one second here. I think this will be worth it. Here we go. 
Okay. All right, so if, if we take a look at this bed right here, hopefully you can see this. I'm going to zoom in here. All right. Boy, this is, I hope, hopefully you can see this. Now, this bed right here, I'm concerned that you're not going to be able to see it. I don't know if that's going to be any better whatsoever. All right, so the thing to know about this is this is a Ranger. We run three 21-inch mowers on this truck. So we have a good number of crews that, you know, as you've probably heard me talk, you might pick up that we're fairly focused. So in our marketplace, we can do everything from lots that are 5,000 square feet up to multiple acres, multi-million dollar homes, all the way down to, you know, $60,000 homes that are junky, and, you know, that you know, the yards are junky, they have no irrigation. Now, Harvard, obviously, there's not much of a market there, but we have everything. If I mean, I don't care what part of the country you're in. I guarantee we have what you have in our, our part of the country. Now, it may be different. You may have more of a certain type of property than we do, but we have everything. And so, for example, you know, just two miles from our house, or two miles from our house, well, actually a few miles from my house, but a couple miles from our shop, um, you know, you'd be hard-pressed to find too many properties that, um, you, you've got one of two things. You've got properties that are about 13,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet, and you go just a little bit further, a lot of the properties are acre, an acre, right around where I live, um, just, just, to the east of me, most of the properties that I live by are one and two acre lots per house. And so, you know, there's a lot of that. We just don't do that stuff. We focus on commercial or specific types of residential, and it's just simply because we fig it's all about density. It's figuring out your numbers. It's figuring out your ideal clients. So now we do bigger stuff. We run riders as well. But my point is I've got a good number of trucks here that are just these we don't even use walk behind, so we're going to run anywhere from say 5,000 square feet to a 20,000 square foot lot. We're still going to use 21 inch Toros on the property. So hopefully you can see this image here, and I wanted to tell you that so you can understand what's going into this truck. So this truck right here, we roll three 21 inch mowers into this truck. Then there's a bar that runs right here and a bar that runs right there. Two weed eaters hang on this bar. On the other side, we can hang another weed eater and a stick edger. And you'll notice back there, there's some yellow, or there's some, let's see here, there's some orange uh, weed eater line right there. And then if we come back towards us right here, this is where a five gallon igloo water jug can go. Then right back underneath that, on the far side of the truck, you'll notice a place where we can put gas cans in there and they lock down. And this is one of our older truck designs, actually, now that I'm looking at this. It's changed since then. This, by the way, this weed eater line right here, it's on a spring-loaded bar. And so it pops on there with the spring, and it holds it, and it spins if you pull it. This right up here on the top, you'll notice there's a rack. We put bags in here. We can put a toolbox. We can put all kinds of stuff, more gas cans. All right, so now the mowers roll in. One mower rolls in on the far side and the front two wheels touch against that box that the gas cans lock down into. When I saw you lock down into it, it's not a cover over them, but the barrier, the mesh around them, the steel, and it's not flimsy, is such that they're not going to fly out. I mean, they fit down in there. We measured everything out and designed it to fit perfectly. We buy predominantly certain types of equipment, so everything just works. So then now if you work, there's the bars. The two wheels lock up against, roll up against that. Now work your way back. And right here you have a bar. It's like a small metal bar. When you roll the mower in, it drops down into this little indention here, and these wheels don't move. I mean, literally, you pop up the front of the deck, roll it in here. The deck probably slides, or you lift up the back wheels in the deck, and then you push the front wheels all the way up. I mean, this is fast. I'm making this sound like it's a tedious process, but you push the wheels all the way up against the mesh, and you drop down the back end of the deck, the mower, and it sits down in there. And if you you know, you shake the bars of the mower, the mower doesn't move, it's in place. Now then, the next two mowers roll up here on the on the closer side here, which is the right side. One rolls up and hits the mesh at the back, near the back of the truck. This is the, the extended cab truck, so it rolls up against the back of it. There's mesh right there. The next mower rolls in right behind it, and the back wheels touch the, the front wheels of the second mower, touch the back wheels of the first mower, and right back in here, there's another bar in it. When the two mowers are in there together touching, neither one of them move. They don't move at all. Now, if you had to, 
you could you could do all kinds of things. Like these things just don't move. And if we were to get in a wreck, they're not really going to fly out. In fact, these trucks have been in wrecks before. We got hit, one of our trucks got hit head on, and um, you know the mowers didn't fly out of the truck. So we thought about all that kind of stuff. In worst case, you could use one bungee cord, or I wouldn't even use bungee cords. I would design it if you were worried about your equipment flying up and over the cab of the truck. I would design it in, as such that something would go across the uh, the mowers, a bar or something. That's not really a concern. For example, we have this big uh, box up here on the top. The mower rolls underneath this box right here. So it rolls underneath this area. Now, let me see if I can go, let's see if we can find a different view here. Um, you can sort of see it back here. Notice how this slopes. So here's the bed. Notice how it slopes down back here. So it's a sloped bed so that one guy can load the truck without having to pick up the mower. He just he just pushes down on the bars, pops up the front of the deck, wheels roll up on the mower. So one guy can load the entire truck. Now, one thing that is worth noting is if you can make this out, there's mesh in the back. So half, if you imagine the bed, the width of the bed, let's say it was six feet across. Three feet of it across is going to be a fixed gate, if you can see that right there. It's completely fixed. It doesn't open. The other three feet is a long, tall, fixed gate that drops down. Now, we used the, you, at one time we used a folding gate. The folding gate leads to potential pinching a finger or different kinds of problems. I don't recommend it. It's a pain in the butt. There's maintenance in, involved. So we went with a tall gate. It's tall. And it doesn't, maybe it doesn't look quite as good, but it really doesn't look bad. And this gate just sits, so it's literally, there's one pivot. You just lower the gate. There's no... There's not two arms on it. There's not two hinges. Just lays down. You roll the mower up on it. Now, when this is closed, the the blowers just sit back here. We don't lock the blowers down back here. Now, there's room. We can generally put a blower up in the box and such. But what, the way we've got this set up, I mean, we're going from property to property. We just between properties, we just stick the blowers back there and go to the next house. So we are sacrificing a bit here from a security standpoint because it's not all locked up. But if you run numbers, I mean, the guys are generally by the properties because a lot of the trucks that do this type of work, they're doing smaller properties. They're doing volume. And so, you know, the guys see the truck. We don't really have a big theft problem. We have some theft. But, again, to try to stop five weed eaters or blowers from being stolen, we don't really have weed eaters being stolen because they lock in here. One bar turns, locks down all the weed eaters. There's just one pivot, locks down everything. And but a blower is the most likely thing to get stolen off of our trucks. So yeah, three hundred dollar gets stolen here and there. But in terms of sacrificing this entire setup over a few blowers that are going to be stolen a year, it's not worth it. And generally, you're not really getting a three hundred dollar blower get stolen. You're getting a hundred and fifty dollar blower stolen because the thing is, you know, been used for the last year or so. So reality of it is, is the the theft potential is well outweighed by the cost savings to do something like this. All right, so that's a little bit about this truck. Now, I don't have a picture here of a bigger truck, but this is easy. Just magnify the size of it. Take the same concepts. You know, that's all we've done in our other equipment. We just, we've just taken these kinds of concepts and just made them bigger. Now, um, the, you know, for when you get into fertilization and weed control and you get into pest control and some of the other things we're doing inside of our boxes, we don't really show any of that stuff. Um, but it's you know we've you've just we've really thought through it we've thought we've drawn it out we've diagrammed it just take these kind this kind of a thought process and work it through on a bigger scale for commercial and then if you are inside a box you've got all this great real estate or all this great space around the edges of the box for um you know for places for shovels and places for things to hang up and uh you know you just kind of work through it like that so that's that's the concept, and then once you work through it, you, you shop around until you find somebody that can build these things for you. And you do need to shop around to find the right pricing. Uh, by the way, when we rip the, the beds off these things, so we buy these trucks, and uh, we immediately take the truck bed off and sell it on Craigslist. So you get a little bit of money back there, and then we paint the truck and such after that. So that's a little bit about how that works. Let me go back over here to the question. So that's the gist of the question. So that's how that works. So let's move on to another one. All right. How can I profit from the green 
lawn care industry and what is the and what potential do you see for the future for the green lawn care or for green lawn care so I take it we're not talking how can I profit from the green lawn care industry I talk I think I take it we're talking about the green industry which is the lawn care landscape industry I, I assume we're not Boy, I hope I'm not about to answer this wrong I assume we're not talking about organic here when we say green so I'm gonna answer it the way I I think the questions being asked if I'm wrong just email me again and I'll take another stab at this so how can I profit from the industry well easy answer you can profit from every single aspect in this business across the board throughout the country Canada you know different different markets that I see and I talk to clients in the market is down across the board there's pockets in the United States where it's good or solid or up but even in those pockets competitions up because of unemployment so I would describe the industry as down across the board however I would describe most industries outside of lawn care as down across the board as well so I absolutely would not take the viewpoint that so many people take and think that oh it might be better over here or it might be better in this different business or uh, if I was doing what you're doing or if I was doing what my friend was doing things would be better uh, it always takes years to build something and investment and time and all that so green industry as far as I'm concerned is a great place to be uh, you might have heard me say it before if I was starting over and I've been in a number of different service industries I would start over in this business I would do it again I, I do like this business I have concerns about it so the simple answer here is every single type of service you can offer in the industry is something you can profit from now if your objective is to become a 10 or 20 million dollar a year company which a 10 or 20 million dollar a year company in the lawn care industry is one of the bigger in the entire industry that's a big company um, I don't know the exact statistic but something along the lines of only 11 percent of lawn care companies gross over a million dollars a year so to be 10 20 30 million dollars in the lawn care industry you're starting to rank in the top of the industry so um, you're building a bigger business to get there I personally um, you know don't you don't have to get to that big to make a lot of money so that doesn't need to be your ambition but here's where I'm going with this if you are wanting to get to the five million dollar mark the ten million dollar mark the twenty million dollar mark which is gonna you know that's, that's a totally different kind of business then you're gonna have to think about your business completely different than how you think about it at a million dollars or two million or five hundred thousand or whatever the number is so if you're just hoping to grow to a five hundred six hundred thousand dollar business and take home a nice paycheck which is entirely possible and I mean it's completely realistic you don't really have to get too terribly worried about economics and you know what segments of the industry are better than others I mean it's something to think about but if you're gonna to go to ten million 20 million you've got to really think about this I mean, because that's your scaling so just depends on what your goals here on how much you need to focus on which segments of the industry are the best so right now I think commercial and um, landscape are especially down and everything's down a bit but those two are especially down but I could build a landscape business today that would make me a nice amount of money solely in landscape there's no question about it but I probably wouldn't build a $20 million landscape business. Now, plenty of other guys have. Uh, but uh, my point is that in 20, it would take me a while to build that kind of business. My point is, you know, if I was trying to get to $20 million, the fastest way to get there is not just building a landscape business. It's being in residential maintenance and commercial maintenance and irrigation and different, different segments of the marketplace, different industries. So one of the things you've got to think about here is, you know, how big are you going and, you know, how much do you need to learn about each segment of the industry like irrigation pest control and such and, and that'll help guide what you want to focus on when you're small and starting out that stuff doesn't really matter that much you need to do what you know and what you're passionate about what you're interested in what you have some level of understanding about alright so potential I think is unlimited if I start over I would go into the lawn care industry again the biggest negatives are the things to watch out for is labor I, uh, I'm very concerned about labor it's very difficult um, I find to still find enough legal labor um, it's challenging it's uh, it's one of those big things that you gotta really focus on in your business to really find enough legal workers <clears throat> excuse me I'm a big fan of the H2B visa program uh, if you're not already in it, it's gonna be very hard to get into it it's it's, it's costly and um, 
but my point is I'm, I'm a fan of that program, but it's falling apart right now and it's going through a bigger level of turmoil. But in general, if the, uh, if the program was left alone and improved by the government versus uh, systematically destroyed, as I believe is what's happening, then that is a really good, uh, that's a really good program for the green industry, but I don't really see that as the future. So I'm concerned about that. I think other things you're going to want to watch over time are, and I'm, I'm a big fan of organics. I'm a big fan of, um, of the organic side of the business. It's a challenging side of the business cost wise. And I don't under, I don't claim to have all the answers on this. So somebody, if, if I was arguing with some, <laughs> I wouldn't argue my point very strongly on what I'm about, the statement I'm about to make. But my perception is that the organic side of the business is a little bit harder to get your margins in and grow it to a, a bigger size. Um, I think there's a, it's a nice niche, niche market um, at some level, but I just don't see my I, I find it, I look at my market, I think it would be hard for me to get to where I want to go with 10,000 clients all in the organic segment of the market. Um, I find that that would be difficult. So the, the pricing would have to be higher. The handholding of the client education would have to be higher. So, you know, those are things you might think about. The organic segment of the market's more challenging at some level, but I think it's the future. And um, so that's something to pay attention to. If you watch what's happening on the coast, so watch uh, areas like California, watch what's coming out of Connecticut, watch legislation coming out of New York, Boston. These are markets that um, if you watch what's happening there, they will bleed into the rest of the country in time. So things that are taking place, changes in equipment, emissions, changes in legal uh, lawsuit precedents. So th I'm talking about things now you consider as you get bigger. But watch some of the precedent uh, that are being set through legal activity. Watch some of that, and you'll get a feel for where you're probably going, where the industry is going from a market, from a just a operational economic standpoint, um, be, through legislation changes. So um, concerns are what's going to be, you know, fuel prices are concerns, but I don't fret over fuel quite as highly as most people do because it's still on the on the uh, P&L statement is still a relatively small number something to pay attention to, but it's not nearly what labor is. It's not nearly what some of the other costs of the business are. So it's really not the biggest risk factor. Labor is the single biggest risk you have in your business. Um, you know, so these are some things to watch out. So for, so my top concerns in the industry are the H2B visa program, legal labor, because I'm all about legal employees. Um, I personally believe in it. And on top of that, I want to run that kind of a company. I've had the alternative that was far, far, far bigger than my lawn care company, and I don't care to have to deal with the concerns of uh, one day losing hundreds and hundreds of employees uh, because they weren't legal and all the all the stuff that goes with that. So I'd be very careful there. It's not a big issue now. It used to be a big issue when uh, President Bush was in office, but now that President Obama is in office, it seems to not be such a big deal anymore. So I don't have the concerns at this moment about illegal labor, but I still don't do it. And um, I think it's something that, you know, the winds of change in Washington are constantly blowing and who knows what's next. So, you know, just build the business as best you can. So labor, uh, organic products, chemicals, thinking pest control, it's only getting tighter on what you're spraying, thinking fertilization weed control, Roundup issues, uh, MSMA issues. MSMA was just knocked off the market recently. Um, there's, and you may not deal with that product in your marketplace, but these are things that are changing. So chemicals that can be used, labor, H2B visa program. These are big things that concern me long term in the industry and things to watch out for. But other than that, great industry. And I don't care what industry you go to, cleaning, plumbing, whatever, you're going to find a whole set of problems there as well. So there is no the grass is greener on the other side scenario. All right, let's move on. I'm going to skip up here and find something that's a little easier for me to answer quickly. All right, let's do this one. I am I am a new company and only have one thousand dollars to invest in advertising. What do you think is the most important advertising I should do first? I have a logo with business cards and all my equipment, but that is all. Um, I can't give you the complete answer on this because I have to keep some of it quiet because I don't want it public. What we do. But um, I've told it to some some of our service autopilot clients privately. 
And in, in the beginning, I alluded to the roadmap series that's coming that'll probably be about 97 bucks a month. I'll disclose that kind of stuff in there. So let me, I'm going to leave out a couple things that are really good, but this answer is still very, very valid. So if I only had a thousand dollars, if all you've got is a thousand bucks, and that means you don't have a very big company, that's not a knock. That just means you're, you know, that's where you're at. You got, a, and you said you got a new company, so you've got time. That's the thing you got. You got time, but you don't have money. And I can guarantee you that when you have money, you won't have time. That's just about it. Usually flips on you. So um, what will happen is because you have time, you need to think about what you can do with your own time. And uh, you're just going to trade uh, your time for dollars. And so instead of hiring people, you're going to do some stuff yourself. So I would in the spring, I'm assuming you're in the maintenance business, as that tends to be the bigger market. So if you are in the maintenance business and you've got time, then I would do door hangers that uh, are well printed or well done with a good marketing message. Go back to the beginning here and read some of those books I mentioned about direct response marketing. You know, that the, your, your, your headline, your call to action, your compelling offer, how they contact you, your uh, guarantee if you were willing to do something like that. All these factors go into what would be called direct response marketing. There's all these elements to it. If you really work on a decent marketing piece, then um, then hand out those door hangers yourself. you got time. Go out and put them out yourself. And then on top of that, I would go knock on some doors, and if you're scared out of your mind to do that, that's all right. They'll never see you again, ever, so who cares? And um, you'll learn so much from doing that. You'll learn exactly what to say in your marketing pieces from all the people that tell you to um, that they're not interested, that they have no interest in your service, and here's why, whatever. You're going to le learn all the objections, and you're going to answer those objections that you hear most often in your marketing pieces, in your door hangers that you put out on doors. So if, it, if I were starting all over today and I had a thousand bucks, I would knock on doors. And I'll tell you, you, you know, I don't, I don't know how you perceive me, but um, that is not something that gets me excited in any way. I do not care to do cold calling or door knocking or anything. Um, I remember when I did it, when I started the business and I did it for commercial, I, uh, I remember pulling into so many parking lots and thinking of a million things I could be doing that day that I thought were more important that really weren't. And I remember several times not actually doing the, the walking in the doors those days because I chickened out. <laughs> I eventually got over it and did it, but uh, it was hard. I didn't like it. It never turned out that bad. I mean, it was always this, who cares if somebody says, no, I'm not interested, or who cares if somebody's tone is slightly rude? Who cares? I mean, you'll never see them again, ever. I learned more from that experience, and I don't know any of those people that told me to get lost. And, and no, I don't really remember anybody being overtly rude. You know, but but people will be, some will be, and uh, you know who cares? You'll never see them again. They're never going to think about you twice. You're going to think about them long after they're they're think they 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 quit thinking about you five minutes after you're off their property. So um, it's a great learning experience. I learned a lot from doing that. So I would do that, and I'd put out door hangers, and um, I'd put the door hangers out yourself, and. Um, there's no doubt about it. You've got to get a website. Just look. I mean, obviously, I'm going to plug Service Autopilot here. You can come to us, and we'll do the website for you. It's 30 bucks a month. We build everything for you. We post it, email, your domain, everything, 30 bucks a month. I mean, you got to do that because the website is in my number one strategy for getting business is the web. And not just the web, but it's my number one strategy. So you've got to get that process started because it's a process. It takes time. You don't get instant results. So the sooner you start it, the sooner you're going to get results. The longer you wait, the longer, the harder it's going to be to grow your company. So you got to budget that into your thousand bucks. But that's a monthly expense. So, I mean, that's you're you're not going to by the time you spend your first thirty bucks and then sixty days later your second sixty bucks, hopefully you're making some money. So start with those things. Door knocking. Uh, get a website. Postcards. And um, I'm not sorry, not postcards. Door hangers. And uh, pick up a book by Perry Marshall about Google AdWords and start playing with that. Just just dabble in it. It's not your best means of marketing by any means, but start playing with it. All right. How do I give an estimate? So this is from Joshua. How do I give an estimate? By square feet or by what sounds good to you? Uh, no, not by what sounds good to me. <laughs> it's, it, 
I'll explain, but that's not how that's not how you want to do it. What sounds good to your customer and what sounds good to you and what sounds good to you by the way is what you perceive sounds good to your customer. That's the reality of it. So what sounds good to you is definitely not the way you want to do that. Okay. How do you give an estimate? By square feet or by what sounds too good to you? And if you do by square feet, how much do you charge per square foot? The reason I'm asking is I have been troubled when it comes to time to give an estimate and I just need a basic policy to abide by. All right. I've talked about this subject so many times. Square feet in this business all you're doing is selling time. Period. That's what you're doing generally. I mean that's that that becomes a little bit of a false statement for certain services, but at the end of the day, you are in the business of selling time. That's what we're doing. We're selling guys to mow yards. We're selling guys to fix sprinklers. We're selling guys to install pavers. We're selling guys time to do whatever. We are in the business of teaching guys how to be experts at doing their craft, and we sell that time for a profit. That's all we do. And it's our job to maximize our profit and sell as much of that time as we can possibly sell. So everything is a factor of time. The only reason square footage matters is because square footage, when you break it down, gives you a insight into how much time something might take. So square footage is nothing more than an indicator of time that it's going to take. All right? So square footage, the reason I talk about square footage a lot is because, now I can't do this anymore, but there was a time I could have gone out and I could have eyeballed properties. Now, a bunch of the guys at my office that are really smart, they can go out to these properties and they can eyeball these things and they can quote quote it. But only a few of the guys in the business can do that because they've done the work. They've experienced it. Or if they haven't done the work, they've watched the correlation of time and square footage and pieces of equipment being used or number of bushes and sizes of bushes. They've watched all those factors and how they correlate to time. And so in their minds, as you're, you know, if you've ever done a bid where you're you're doing a bush bid, you're in your mind imagining probably yourself trimming those bushes and then cleaning up the debris and saying, uh, you know, for that section right there it'd take me about an hour. And for that section it'd take me another hour. So that's two hours and I need to make thirty dollars an hour, so that's sixty bucks. I mean that's how most guys do it. So at the end of the day, this is all about figuring out how much time it's gonna take and then t multiplying that times the rate you need to make profit. And so square footage is just that. Square footage is how long with a certain type of piece or certain piece of equipment will it take me to perform that work. So if it's 5,000 square feet with the 21 inch mower, then I know that it's going to take me 20 minutes, hypothetically. I don't know what it is. I, I, have, I just am saying hypothetically 20 minutes to do 5,000 square feet if I need to achieve forty dollars a man hour, then what are, you know you're looking at something what around thirteen bucks an hour that you've got to get for or thirteen bucks to mow that five thousand square feet or whatever the number is. Don't get caught up in the numbers I'm using. I'm making stuff up here. That's the only basis of square footage. I have been asked this question as well so many times. The, the part I'm referring to now is about the what do you charge per square foot. I just will not give out that answer. Um, I, I'm afraid to give it out because I see guys that go out and buy these price measurement books. You can buy these books or these spreadsheets that are pre-done for you, and you can really get yourself in trouble. I mean, a guy that's new in business that's not using well-trained employees with the right equipment cannot produce at the speed that these these guides say. And also, if you change just a couple factors about what the way they did those measurements and your business is different, like if you go out and you know spring is different than the middle of summer in in regards to how much how thick the grass is and how tall it is and you know so if you're if you're just going off of somebody else's measurements you're going to get yourself in complete trouble and bigger than that worse than that if you don't sit down and figure this out for yourself you'll never learn the correlation of time to square footage so you've got to go out and do this you've got to literally go out and let's say you've got a property that's 9000 square feet put a mower on the property and mow it and you've got you so you got some more houses that are around 9000 square feet maybe they're gross lot square footage so the you know the the turf is varying from 3 4 5000 square feet but just start out looking at the gross lot square footage and put some mowers out there and time the jobs and just and then start to look at 
averages. Start to look at, okay, well, you know, usually when the lot's about 9,000 square feet, it takes us about, you know, 15 minutes with three guys on the property. And you start to figure these, these things out. That's how you start to build, build out this correlation of square footage to time. And you start to be able to put some numbers to square footage. And as you get more sophisticated, then you start to really, for commercial and bigger residential, start to break it into pieces. I mean, there's no... A lot of guys just eyeball it, and they aren't going to do this stuff, and that's fine. But if you really want to build a big company, you can still do some eyeballing, and we do it. But you can still do it, but you've got to get it down to square foot footage. You have to, because and and you've got to eventually go out there, and you got to put guys out there on 21 inch mowers and 61 inch riders and walk behinds, and you've got to literally have three guys do the same jobs and take averages over time and come up with some averages of what it takes to mow. X number of square feet with a 21 versus with a 61 and you just and it you will not build these calculations tomorrow they're going to take a season and you've got to be diligent about tracking your start and end time at every job knowing the turf square footage the gross square footage of the lot if it's a small property if it's a big property you've got to know the square footage that's mowed with 21 inch mowers which is 61 inch mowers you got to know the linear footage of the edging of the concrete you got to know this stuff you got to write it all down track it all and then track the time and then over months you start to run this through your spreadsheet and you start to look at it I'll do a dedicated video on showing you some of this stuff at some point but that's that's how it works and so I can't really give you a square footage charge um, just start out by tracking it it's going to be different for every business and it's also going to change as your business gets better if I had based if I was basing all my quotes on my production rates of five years ago, six years ago, I think now when we started the business, then I mean, my gosh, we would we we were pitiful back then compared to what we're doing now. Now we now we've got things figured out. We did not have things figured out in the first year, not even in the second year. So we were figuring it out. We were learning. But fortunately, I was tracking some of that, not all of it, but some of it back then. The more we track, the more we learn. So this is a process. Don't get too worried about it. You're not going to get the answer perfect right now, but start tracking these numbers. Um, I can expand on that more in another video, but i got to keep moving here. This next one here may be a little bit of a tie-in. Um, I am now in the process of building a business systems and procedures, but I'm having a tough time getting it all documented because I'm not too sure how an established lawn care business system really looks on paper. If you could please give me some advice on how to properly format and document systems in a lawn mowing business, that would be great. P.S. I'm a big fan of what you are doing in the lawn industry. Service Auto Pilot's awesome, and you've helped me a lot with the advice on your website. Great. That's cool. Um, okay, cool. Um, all right. Good. This is this is a good question right here, and this uh, I've taken the names out of these, so I don't remember who asked me the question, but whoever asked me this question, good question. You're definitely thinking about this right. All right, so um, let me simplify this for you a little bit. If you've read the book, The E-Myth, and maybe you read, maybe the, whoever's asking me this question, I apologize, I took your name off here, now I don't know who it is, but whoever asked me this question, you may have mentioned that you just finished reading the book, E-Myth. Somebody has asked that question recently. That's a good book, by the way. If you guys have never read the book, E-Myth, it's an old book. It's got to be, geez, I would think it's 20 years old. Um, I'm going to probably go over on time here, so if um, if you uh, don't want to stay on the line, then just drop off the line, but I'm going over more than likely here because i got a couple other questions I want to get to that I haven't got to yet. Right here, E-Myth Revisited. Buy that book. It's a good book. It's an old book by a guy named Michael Gerber, but it'll make your uh, brain turn. and It'll make you think about some stuff, so check that book out. Okay, so now if you read this book, there's a couple things in it that I sort of disagree with but it's been a long time since I read the book and um, I gotta be careful when I say disagree because that's a pretty smart guy there and it's a great book where I'm going with this is sometimes proceduralizing things too much is a negative I think about this a lot from a customer service standpoint so for example um, at my lawn care company and at service autopilot we don't have canned responses to questions we do have canned responses to emails and we have systems of what happens when a client signs up versus when you know a client uh, becomes a lead but doesn't sign up that day versus what happens you know after they've been a client for a period of time versus what happens if they don't buy a certain service. We got systems around that stuff, but I don't have canned responses 
Um, I'm kind of negative on that. I feel like Emith probably, and it's been a while since I read the book, but I would kind of think that Emith probably said that you need to have canned scripts and such. And we do use some of that. I don't really use scripts. Um, we use more bullet points. So, hey, here are the five talking points about fertilization and weed control. Here's the five major selling points on weekly lawn care, open bi weekly. You know, we'll do stuff like that. But in my mind, it's more about training. It's more about educating your team, training them, listening to them, guiding them, encouraging them, and making them smart enough that they can answer and being willing to let them say some crazy stuff like you would say some crazy stuff when you're learning. And, you know, just, you know, you got to go through the process. So I'd rather have somebody at our company that knows what they're talking about and when they don't know the answer, they say, I don't know the answer, and they get the answer and come back to the client versus using scripts. You know, I, I prefer the training approach. Not that EMIS says don't do that, but I'm not real big on scripts. I hate calling Visa or American Express, and I can tell they're reading something to me. I hate that. You know, and so, and I think most people do, but if, you know, if you call somebody and you just, like, can tell the person knows what they're talking about, they care, and you feel like this, they're having a unique conversation with you, that's good. That's good service. So that's what I'm about. So I think there's this balance here between uh, overly scripted, over, overly proceduralized, and just flat out hiring the right people that are smart enough to make wise decisions. And when they screw it up, oh well. I mean, oh well, as long as it's not an intentional massive disaster. But you know, it's a learning experience. And you know, if they're one of the better uh, people on your team, or they're one of you know, if you hired the right people, they're not going to do it again. You know, that's how you learn. So. Um, you can't prevent everything with the script. I think it leads to different to downsides. So where I'm going with this is, here's an idea. Along these lines, um, let me get back to the question. Yeah, so along the lines, as you're thinking about defining your procedures, uh, think about something else. So I'm, gonna throw, I'm throwing two ideas at you here, at you here and I'm going to tie them together. Think about the concept, and this has taken me a while to get this one. You're better to get something mediocre out into the marketplace now than to make it perfect. And I'm, I'm a violator of that one, but I'm getting better about it. Um, I really now believe that it's better to ship product sh to, you know, product, I say product, it could be software, but it could also, or a service or, or some kind of an offering, but a product is, I'm, I'm talking about a service as well, you know, to get a new product offering, a new service out into the marketplace before it's perfectly perfected, before your script's perfected, before you know every single question a client could ask you, before you know exactly how to do the service, you got to just get out there and get your feet wet. So one of the big mistakes is trying to proceduralize and document everything too early. Um, I almost think you've got to initially go do it a whole bunch of times and figure it out and just make some documentation as you go, like literally write down the steps. You know, write down what's working, but don't, I, for proceduralizing stuff, I absolutely would not try to do too much in advance. If you want to document out some job roles or some things like that, get some loose notes down on paper, some ideas, but then get out there and do it. Do some of it yourself, put it in, you know, give it to somebody on your team and say, hey, go do this, try this system out, and, and let's figure out where it breaks, where it doesn't work. Um, there's no way to figure this stuff out in advance. Trying to figure it out is just going to slow you down, so you got to get out there and just do it. And uh, make some notes about it as you go. And then as you figure it out, don't try to document everything yourself. Have your team do it. I think that's a really, really wise approach too. So for example, if you want to implement, uh, I'll give you an example. At our office right now, we're implementing a new procedure for um, how to uh, do a better job communicating with new clients, which will uh, really help with retention, which will help with uh, a great first impression, which will help with the whole client experience. You know, what happens the moment they sign up? We already had things we were doing, but it, it's one of those things that has to get better in the business. So I've got ideas on it. I've thought about it, but instead of me doing it, I've asked somebody on our team that's really smart to work on that themselves and document it. And we'll all look at it with them and um, we'll come up with some ideas and we're going to try what they came up with and, and they're going to see what works and what doesn't work, and they're going to tweak it. And I may have a few ideas, and that person's going to work on this procedure themselves. Or if you've got procedures that are already working really well, don't document them. Tell the person that's doing them to document what they do. And tell them to think about it in the sense that if they get promoted and they have to move on, they're not going to have three months to train the next person. They're going to want to get right onto the new job that they're doing. So they need to be able to hand the document to somebody that says, do this, do this, look here to get this, here's the username and password for that, whatever. You know, 
they need to think about it at that level of how they document this out. So um, without going into too much more detail here, the two big takeaways on this one are it's hard to document too much in advance. So just get down a few things on paper, try them and tweak it. Just jump in, get your feet wet, make some mistakes, screw it up, learn from your mistakes, tweak the process as you go, document as you go. Uh, the idea that you're going to sit down and document everything here over the next the winter months, not going to happen, not realistic. You're going to build your procedures over the next year or two, and they're going to get tweaked. Um, also, sometimes your team might get frustrated with you because they think, hey, he's got this new idea, and then we quit doing it two weeks later. Or he's got this new idea and uh, this new procedure, and we did it for about six months, and it fizzled. You know, I think one of the things about policies and procedures is you've got to be willing to let them fail. Who cares if, you know, I mean, from, who cares if you stop doing something after two weeks? Stop doing it after two weeks if it's a bad procedure. Your team may look at you know the several times that you stop doing things that they that you just look at it from the viewpoint of hey oh, he keeps coming up with some new idea and then we stop doing it. Well, that is actually the wise approach regardless of how they feel. It's the wise approach if the procedure wasn't a benefit. Don't waste their time. Don't waste yours. Everything about your business is a it's a living organ. It's a living thing. I mean it's evolving. It's changing. Things your procedures need to change. So. You can't be in charge of documenting that, so have the people that are in charge of them document it. As they document it, they'll learn to look at those things differently and see what works and what doesn't and change things about it. And then as they tweak it, they add, they just pull out their documentation and update it. And so that's one thing. So just jump in, start doing it. Don't go overboard on the documentation. Don't spend too much time on it. It will slow you down. Just do it over time. And then the second thing is have your team help you do this documentation and uh, have them do most of the legwork for you, give it to you, and then because uh, it's more buy-in from them as well, but also they're doing it. Let them let them document it. Let them have some uh, say in this thing. If they're the ones that have to do it, work with them to, together to figure out the best procedure. All right, so that one's done. Again, I'm going over here, so if you want to drop off the line, I'm going to try to answer a couple more. And uh, for everybody I don't get to, like for example, I didn't even put all the questions on here. I just put on the ones I could I hoped I could get to um, all right let me read this one real quick I was interested in using your software next season and I noticed that you take credit cards and I think most people pay for your service at the time of service or before yeah earlier I said they pay for it uh, the following Tuesday you said that when you charged um, change from billing at or after the service you said that when you changed from billing, was there a lot of resistance to do so, and did you lose any customers? Yes, there would have been a lot of resistance, and that's why I mentioned earlier that we grandfathered them in. I'm tired of collecting money, and I'm having to justify billing. This was exactly why I went to that program. So I actually already addressed this question. So yes. I grandfathered the existing clients in. The clients that continued to give me problems that were existing clients went back to them and said, hey, you know, we've changed our policy. We've got to get a credit card from you. I don't remember losing too many clients at all um, because, again, because we grandfathered them in. But I'm sure we did lose a few. And we've lost a few potential clients over the years because of our policy of requiring a credit card. But they're generally the clients who probably didn't want. So and I'm sure we've lost some great clients because of it. But uh, you never make decisions for the exceptions. You make decisions for uh, what's best for the business. So I consider a few clients that don't sign up each year exceptions. Um, all right, so all right, let me let me read this one because I want to answer this question. Hey Jonathan, I uh, just found your website and you offer a great service and I'm already gaining valuable insight from your knowledge and experience. Thank you. Um, I have a commercial landscape maintenance business in Vancouver. I have learned the hard way that s and struggled many uh, for a long time doing residential with no advertising budget. But in the last eight years, I've transitioned to the commercial sector and have been doing much better. I have many questions, and I'm wondering if you do consultations or coaching sessions by phone or email, and if you have expertise in the commercial landscape maintenance for the Canadian market. Uh, no, not specifically for the Canadian market, but I, um, I'm sure there's differences, but uh, no, most of my experience is in the U.S. market. So, however, I guarantee you there are only so many differences. Um, answering consultations and coaching, no, I'm not, I'm not doing any of that yet. Um, I'm 
I always say that. I do some, but I turn away most all of it because I just am so limited. I'm trying to – it goes back to that focus. I'm trying to focus. Uh, coaching. I Yes, I have something coming in 2012. It will be not cheap, but it will be really, really good. So, yes, I have something coming there. And it will be uh, one-on-one time with – well, not one-on-one time, but I'll announce it next year. But I've got something coming. Um, do all of your videos pertain to commercial – also, do all your videos pertain to commercial as well as residential homeowners? Yes. Okay. And um, sorry, I'm reading this question here. I read it a couple days ago, and um, <laughs> I logged this when I wanted to answer, so I apologize. I'm having to uh, reread this here. I will ask one question out of the many. I have four trucks, but only two are on the road. All right, so you've got two crews with four employees and one part-time. I gross 31 k per month, but I am not saving anything. So you're spending all the money you bring in. All my business and personal bills get paid and can do things, but I am in af all my business and personal bills get paid and can do things, but I am in overdraft monthly. All right, so money's tight, but your bills are covered, but it's tight. Are the first two trucks just covering and absorbing all the business and personal expenses and all future trucks I can add will be profitable ones or do you sense I'm doing something wrong in my financing and operations this is a great question so hopefully this is a value to to, uh, to more people I want to answer this one all right so there's a whole bunch of stuff we could talk about on this one if you are if you are paying your personal expenses out of your business I may be wrong here you have gotta stop doing that so let's focus on this aspect first, and then I'm going to answer the question. It is absolutely critical that you maintain, and I again, I'm making some assumptions here, but and you may not be doing this, but this may help. In case you are, it's very, very, very critical that you have a business bank account and a personal bank account. You absolutely cannot intertwine your personal expenses with your business expenses. You can do it. You'll never sell the company if you do that. Second, um, you can do it, and one day, if you get audited and bad things happen, it's going to be a mess. Um, there's a million reasons why you can't be doing this. You you cannot run your personal expenses out of your business account and have any understanding of what's going on in your business. So my guess is right now that you couldn't tell me, and I'm making assumptions here because we've never spoken, but my guess is you're grossing 31 a month. My guess is you can't tell me how much money you really make. Like you don't know if you make 3000 a month or you make 9000 a month personally. You might have a guess, but I doubt you really know. You'll know if you run your personal and your business separately. So for example, if you run a separate bank account, you keep separate books, you never pay anything out of the same checking account, personal out of business checking account, then you'll know each month how much money is left over in that business account because you're going to write a check for 5000 bucks hypothetically to your personal account so you can pay your personal bills. That's really, really, really an important concept. You've got to separate the two. Um, if you're by chance an LLC or an S-Corp now, I know you're in the Canadian market here, so things are different. But depending on your entity and how you formed your company and different things, in the U.S., there's legal issues. By So I'll give you an example. You could do what's called uh, for me an LLC. And if you ever get sued, your business and you get sued, your lawyer, not your lawyer, but the lawyer coming after you might look to see if they can do what's called piercing the corporate veil. So they're going to look for activities in your business that basically insinuate or show or demonstrate that, yes, you're an LLC, but you're an LLC in name, not in practice, because you don't do certain things that a true business entity would do. For example, you pay your personal expenses out of the business account. Uh, you run all your stuff out of one bank account. You do, you know, X, Y, Z. You don't keep corporate minutes. You on and on and on. They're going to look for just cause to go after you and say that they have the right to pierce the corporate veil, which means that they can then get around the LLC, come after your personal assets. The whole point of the LLC is to protect your personal assets. So if they can pierce that, then they can come after what you own personally. First violation here is running everything out of one account or not you know not keeping everything completely separate so if you're not doing that do it because it's going to tell you what your profit is on these two crews um, 
there is truth to the fact that yes, your first two crews may cover, may not. So, like, I'll give you an example here. Like, let's say you're taking eight thousand bucks a year out of the bus- a month out of the business. I doubt you are, but let's say you are. So you're you're covering eight thousand a month in bills, just make to make up numbers here. And you're making thirty-one thousand. So you're insinuating that your business isn't doing very well because there's no money left over. You're an overdraft every month, but that's not fair because you're actually paying yourself to live. You're covering your expenses. And if you're in fact making eight thousand a month, hypothetically, it could be five, it could be four, whatever that number is. You're actually turning a profit on this business. You're you're paying yourself to run the company. That's not all bad. Yeah, maybe money's tight, but you're actually making money here. So you can't look at the business and say, oh, this is a, you know, this is not a good business. I mean, I'll give you another analogy. Let's say that I have a $10,000 a month lifestyle and you have a $5,000 a month lifestyle and we both have $31,000 a year businesses and you have a couple thousand bucks left over each month after you pay yourself your 5000 a month to cover your lifestyle. So you look at your business and say, hey, I got a good business. I'm making money here. I got a couple thousand bucks left over at the end of the month. And then in my business, I have this $10,000 a month lifestyle, so I don't even have enough money to cover it. So every month I'm going two, 3000 bucks in debt. I'm looking at my business saying, my business is junk. There's no profit. This is a lousy business. Well, that's completely unfair because I'm just needing more money out of the business. And my personal lifestyle is making the business look bad. So my point is to first evaluate your business, you've got to completely separate your personal expenses. I have no idea. You, if you're taking 8000 a month out of your business to live, that's a good business. If you're taking 5000 out of your business a month to live on 31 k well, I mean, it's a profitable business. You're making 5000 a month. That's not bad. Now, yes, as you add your third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh truck, absolutely, your take goes up. Um, for example, at 31000 you might be covering some fixed costs. I don't know if you have any fixed costs in your business, but maybe you have a little office. Maybe you have some warehouse space. You've got your phone lines covered. You've got your website. You've got some basic. You've got your, you know, your costs to run the business. You've got some overhead costs, some just costs that you incur doing business covered. And maybe you've got some room in there to scale. Like, for example, you could add another crew. And you don't have to add a phone. You don't have to add, you know, they don't need another one of you. You don't have to rent another office or rent another warehouse or rent another shed or public storage unit or whatever you do. So, you know, so for as so those types of expenses don't go up as you add the next crew. So there's a there's a number of expenses in the businesses in your business that will not increase with every additional crew you add. They might increase with every five crews you add or something of that sort. So my point is that if your first two crews are covering your business expenses, forget your personal, but covering a lot of your business expenses that are somewhat fixed, that some that don't necessarily increase as you sell more work and add more crews, then yeah, your your numbers are going to get better with your third and fourth crew. If you are um, covering your personal expenses with two crews now, and you're not going to up your lifestyle, meaning that when you add the third crew and you start making more money, now you're actually going to have money left over. So yes, it's about to get better. So um, you know, this, th- yeah, I mean, because you're taking your personal expense out of here, it's very hard for me to give you a great answer, except to say that you're you're living on two crews. Your third crew, if you don't up your living expenses, means you're going to have money left over if you're pricing your work right, that you're going to be able to reinvest in the company to add the fourth crew. So that's not all bad. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong answer and say, oh, you're doing great, because I really don't know, because I don't know how much money you're taking out of the business. I It's hard for me to say that, but I I do want to get the point across that you can't you can't say the business isn't doing all that good at thirty one thousand because I have no idea how much personal money you're taking out of the business. My last point here I've talked about this before, so my theory from what I've experienced in business in service businesses is that if you want to keep this business small here, run maybe two to four trucks, if you really work on optimizing the and that, so you if you have in your mind that, hey, I'm just going to have two to four crews or whatever that number is, and we're going to stay that big and we're not really going to go bigger. You may be able to run, say, four crews yourself. There's a there's a, a level that you're going to bump up here in the hundreds of thousands where you're going to eventually have to get somebody to help you run this thing. So right now you're running at um, roughly 360 a year. So you're getting close to that point more than likely where it's going to be difficult to for you to run too much of the business, especially if you're still out in the field at all. 
um, you may you know you may bump into another level here pretty soon in the as you add more money or add more revenue to the business more crews um, in commercial this may not quite be true just yet uh, in residential it's more likely but you're going to bump into a point here pretty soon where you're going to need somebody to come in and help you you know get the crews out in the morning go do some estimates things like that I don't I doubt you're at that point though if you're a commercial business you shouldn't be there yet so here's where I'm going if you in your mind set out and say hey I'm just going to go to two to four crews they're going to be highly optimized highly profitable work it's going to run like we're going to really focus and I'm going to work year after year and really making this run smoothly um, you can get some really good mark some really good profit out of those crews however if you look at it differently you say you know what I'm at two crews now but I want to go to 20 crews or maybe I want to go to 10 million or whatever the number is you know 5 million whatever well then you're in a totally different mindset and I've talked about this before so you gotta gotta figure out what you want to do here as you're thinking about your profits are you going to four crews that are it's just gonna be a well-oiled machine that's gonna spin off profit you're never gonna make you're never gonna take seven figures home a year in personal income or anything like that you're never gonna take home half a million a year in personal income at four crews you know you're gonna have to go you're gonna have to go pretty big to get to that point but if that's okay I mean if you want to take home you should take home a six-figure paycheck so it will be low six figures but you could get to a six-figure paycheck here and uh, keep your business somewhat small manageable now if you're going big then <clears throat> excuse me if you're going big this is gonna have a really big impact on your profit margin so you kinda gotta decide where you're going here my point is if you're only gonna stay at four then you're not gonna have to invest in a lot of overhead you're not gonna have to pre-hire all the employees you're gonna to need to scale up to a million dollars to two million to five million dollars because if you're gonna to go to those levels you're gonna have all kinds of asset acquisition costs um, you're gonna start playing more of the tax game you're gonna start thinking about who's my future leaders of the business who's my ops manager who's gonna run this part of the company you know you're starting to think maybe about salespeople you're definitely starting to think about the office team that you're going to build out because you've got to build out all that stuff before you get to the level. You never go to five million and then hire the people. You hire the people to get to five million. And then when you say, you know, our sites are now set on going to 5,000 clients or, or going to, you know, bigger commercial or whatever the number is, going to two million more in revenue, you always have to hire and staff and buy equipment and trucks in advance of that stuff. So, my point is that type of planning, that type of mindset, that type of investing back into the company to build it so that you're set up to go into a growth mode costs a lot of profit and it will massively affect your profit margins. I think there's this real in-between awkward stage. Maybe it's just something I've experienced now a couple times or maybe there's maybe it's actual a fact. But I feel like if I was starting over from my experiences, I could build a small couple man a couple uh, crew business and, uh, and and have some pretty high profits pretty quickly however what I've experienced is that when I make the transition to a bigger operation I go through this middle area where the profit margins aren't all that exciting I'm reinvesting in the company I'm not making a lot of money but I, because I'm really investing I'm investing in what will be the future of the business what will yield me much much bigger profits down the road it's like I've, you might have heard me say before I'm not interested in making a hundred thousand dollars a year I mean, I'm interested in that, of course. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not interested in just making thirty thousand and then thirty-five thousand and forty-five thousand a year, and then someday after years of work and getting a hundred grand, I would rather forego some of that profit now, throw it back in the business, and get a much, much bigger payout year after year down the road, and do it faster than taking big paychecks now. So that you you want to think about that as you're growing this business here. I'm a little off your topic, but but it speaks to profits. So depending on where you're going with this. You know, keep in mind, keep this concept in mind as you're growing, because if you're going to, you could be stuck in a middle ground for several years where you're really reinvesting in the business. Margins are low because the money's all being plowed back into the business. And, um, and that will have a big effect on your business. So to an outsider, they might say, oh, wow, you're not, you know, you're not really doing all that great. You're not generating very high margins or whatever the case may be, but they don't understand what's happening. They don't understand that you know it costs money to build a business and, and invest and hire people and all the things that goes into it the reality of the situation is you are not going to generate double digit margins twenty percent profit margins whatever the case may be and take all that money off the table while you massively grow a company it is impossible i don't care what you're doing i don't care what industry you're in you're not going to do it very very few companies can do such a thing 
And so you're going to go into this awkward phase for a while where there's just not going to be a lot of leftover money, and that's just part of the game. So um, my point is, you asked a question here about profits and how are you doing. Well, think about this next phase that you might be entering here because you're at two crews and you might be going to four or five. I'm not saying things are going to get worse, but I'm, not, I'm at the same time saying you may not see this massive jump in. If you go from two to, say, six crews, you may not, you may not find that next year you've suddenly got 10000 bucks a month left over in the bank account. Because if you're going into a growth phase, money still may remain tight for some period of time. You have to be, you have to make a decision on how much you're willing to put up with that. Uh, if you don't want money to be as tight, then you don't want to grow as fast. If you want to have a little bit more of a cushion and play it a little safer, then you grow slower. That's just how it works. Or you need to have a rich uncle that's going to give you a whole bunch of money. But that's a sucky solution as well because then you don't own your own company. Somebody else owns part of it. But, but my point is that uh, these are things you really want to think about. So the only way you can start making real decisions is to get all your personal expenses out of the business and be able to send me back an email and say, hey, I generate 31000 a month. I take 6000 a month off the table to live on. And so I'm um, about 25000 of my, my uh, business's expense. And uh, the other 6000 is covering me to run the company. Then I could give you some feedback on if it's good or bad. So great, great, great question, though. All right, so I am going to wrap this up, and there's two questions I didn't get to. I'm going to answer them. And one of these right here, this guy here, Jimmy, this is one of our service autopilot clients. And um, Jimmy, you'll definitely get an answer. Jimmy's one of our favorite clients. Not that, I mean, not that uh, he gets preference, but I'm just saying <laughs> Jimmy is an awesome client. And Jimmy, I will get with you on this question. You will get an answer to this one. And then uh, this one down here. Whoever's question this is, if you recognize this, it's a pretty long one. Um, I wanted to answer this. I'm just out of time. I'm way over. I will get you an answer. Everybody, thanks for joining me on the call. Please give me feedback. Jonathan at Long Care Millionaire. Was this good? LongCareMillionaire.com. Was this good? Was it helpful? Different direction? Is it boring? Um, would you rather just see me standing in front of camera talking? Um, what can I do to make this more valuable? Or will you even? is this even something I should continue doing? Should I just just only do videos. So any feedback you can give me, I will uh, appreciate it and I will listen to it. So thanks again and uh, best wishes to you and your business. And next month I'm going to do this again. So if you want to uh, just check back at Long Care Millionaire and register for the next call. Thanks again.